Hello my dear friends, how is it going? I'm Mari Theriger and today I would like to talk a little bit about necromancy. Just a few words on the subject which I think it may prove useful to some of you, but perhaps mostly for me. You see, the objective of this video is to express a few notions concerning necromancy because I would like you to also comment in relation to this matter and uh, share with me and with all of us your insights and experiences. I've done this before, as you know it, and I've shared with you some insights and uh, conceptions and, and perceptions concerning other subjects or other themes. Uh, and you have also shared in the comments information and knowledge, which proves to be quite useful, <laughs> at least to me, uh, not only as a sort of interview to get to know people's minds, and how they approach certain subjects in practice and conducting things in their private lives. But it's also quite useful to me as I note down, I literally note it down what you write to me, which then helps me to draw comparisons and to find parallels, not only between people and how they experience things, but also finding parallels with my own experiences. And uh, this ends up creating a tapestry of knowledge uh, by connecting strings here and there. Uh, and I take the opportunity to, to say uh, beforehand uh, my apologies, <laughs> as I may not always have the time to reply to all of you, but I, I really do the effort to read as many comments as possible. And I would very much like you to interact on this video as well and share with all of us your personal experiences in terms of necromancy. And again, uh, it will be quite helpful to me uh, to compare experiences and find parallels that in the long run will certainly paint a bigger picture with more details. Now, uh, I think a disclaimer is in order. Today's video isn't an academic work, not at all, in the slightest. The entire approach isn't academic, mind you. Uh, those who have been into this channel for quite some time, and even those who are new within this corner of YouTube or coming in here for the very first time, uh, I have many videos that are indeed my academic works on video format with bibliography in the videos themselves, usually by the end of those videos, or share uh, the bibliography in the description of videos or in, in the comments section. However, once in a while, I like to have a different approach and do videos that are more, uh, let's say, um, in the realms of spiritism, perhaps. I don't know how to, call it, how to call them or how to label them, but definitely some of my videos are not academic in order to broaden the approach to certain subjects that have a greater foundation or, or roots in people's personal beliefs and supernatural experiences rather than a scientific study. In a way, those videos end up being sort of interviews, as I said, which proved to be quite useful in academic contexts later on, in the sense of understanding or trying to understand people's personal experiences and practices, especially when it comes to new age or at least contemporary religious contexts and spiritualities, and how people express their beliefs towards a given worldview or indeed expressions of world views. Furthermore, if the subject of death and the spirits is something you do not feel comfortable with or if you are currently fighting depression or going through a really bad phase in your life where you feel more sensitive, or saddened, and sorrowful and feeling exposed in your anxiety and an absolute sense of dread and prone to melancholy, I do not advise you to watch this video. There's no shame in it, uh, there's no shame in turning away, there's time and space and place and mood for everything and when you feel more apt and with the disposition for it, you can always come to this video some other time later on. No one will judge you, Certainly, I, I won't judge you, uh, as there's absolutely no need to force upon yourself something you don't feel comfortable with. Uh, in addition, I would also like to advise that 
this video is not for children. My YouTube channel and even each of my videos are not meant for children. And in fact, my very channel is register, registered sorry, uh, like that uh, here on YouTube. And for each video, uh, there's also an option uh, that to reinforce that um, it really isn't made for children. That is the extent of my control over my own video productions, right? So underage people won't find my channel or video or video content, unless, of course, they specifically search for it. Otherwise, it won't appear in their suggested videos or even suggested channels. As I said, uh, this is the extent of my control over this. However, I know some of you watch some of my videos with your children, with your sons and daughters. You have told me that. That's something I have no control over it. That's exclusively your choice. But I advise you not to watch this video with children, mostly because I don't think they have yet the capacity to grasp certain subjects and in the best case scenario, it may be quite confusing to them. To finalize this disclaimer, I would also like to add that I'm not here claiming to be a necromancer or to know any necromancer or necromancers or indeed practice necromancy or, or an art of the sort. I'm neither confirming nor denying it because that's not the point. I'm simply here to share with you some thoughts and perceptions. In today's video, I'm not here to deliver the objective truth or a single truth. I strongly believe that what works for a person won't always work for another. We all have our own ways to deal with things in the manner that is more familiar and comfortable to us according to how we perceive things. We are all built differently, right? Uh, different approaches for different people and just because one aspect of life isn't present in someone's reality doesn't automatically mean that it isn't true or that it isn't real. So I think today's video works as an exercise as well as a sort of experiment. You see, throughout the ages uh, there are many accounts of people interacting with spirits and spirit encounters and such. So perhaps our approach shouldn't be to immediately discard the existence of spirits or to simply think it isn't real. We may be facing accounts dealing with the way people experience things, how each individual experiences an encounter or a um, communication with a spirit. As I said, what works for a person may not work for another. So the entirety of different accounts concerning spirits may not be a case of being lies or delusions and we should not assume that people may be mentally ill. Or, or, or dishonest or childish or even playing jokes. I'm not saying that such cases are not true. Sometimes that happens, of course, obviously. What I'm saying here is that some accounts may be true according to how people experience things. Since people experience things differently, many of such accounts may actually be true. But it's simply on the perspective of those who experience it and they may actually tell the truth when they express such accounts because they are expressing it in the way it was possible for them to experience it under their own perceptions and sensitivity and the way they are biologically built that affects their own individual perception of reality. So let's keep an open mind to this and to all possibilities because Many accounts we deem to be supernatural may in fact be truthful, or, uh, truthful expressions of experiences that reflect the reality of those who experience reality and how they experience it. In this way, spirits exist, it's a possibility. But how we experience their existence depends very much on each individual and how each person perceives reality, be that due to illness, hallucination, sensibility to a real presence, through dreams, waking experiences, sound, sensation, perception, recognition or sight, it is being experienced nonetheless. 
and these accounts are real, at least for those who are living a particular reality and how they perceive that reality. So that's that. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this video and I hope it is useful. With no more delay, let's get started, my dear friends. Please. Even though this video isn't academic, uh, I'm quite sure a scientific research in terms of the history behind necromancy would be quite useful, mostly to demystify certain ideas in relation to necromancy and why it had such a bad reputation over the past more or less two millenniums, <laughs> which, much like the term witchcraft and sorcery, it still makes some people a little bit uncomfortable and even fearful. In a very, very summarized general picture, necromancy has always been quite clear in its magical religious approach originally as a um, performance in order to create a connection with the dead to obtain knowledge from the spirits of the departed. Uh, this has been a performance as much as a wish or a desire humanity has demonstrated for almost the entirety of its existence as a species who seeks to understand what lies beyond death, as death is something that deeply troubles our minds, perhaps mostly due to the fear of the unknown and the fear of not being able to control certain aspects of life that are inevitable. I would even say that to establish a communication with, uh, with, the, with the part or establish communication with the dead in general in order to know if there's anything beyond death has been as fervent as wanting to live and remain alive and finding means to extend one's life as much as possible and even try to escape death. Now, the first written sources to speak about necromancy as a term, only a term, for a magical art comes from classical civilizations. Not the act itself or, or a performance or art, but as a term only that can be applied to a type of different magic and even religious performance. Necromantia, as the terminology for the specific act of communication with the dead or the departed for prophetic purposes. In this way, any act whose sole purpose was to establish communication with the dead in order to receive hidden knowledge and information concerning future events was considered necromancy. Even augury, through the observation of the flight of birds, could be considered necromancy, when the belief that birds were the expression of the souls or the spirits of the ancestors was still a strong belief. In this way, the ancestors, through bird flight, would express themselves and the interpretation of this flight for divinatory purposes was, by extent, necromancy. As humanity progresses and certain pagan performances uh, fall into disuse and even prohibited due to fear, ignorance or simply fall into superstition and blasphemy so that other religious powers can be or could be implemented, necromancy, just like witchcraft, has been highly demonized. In a way, the fear due to um, religious beliefs is understandable, I think. If we take into consideration that, archaeologically speaking now, um, at least up until the Iron Age of some societies, we understand that in order to establish communication with the dead or the departed, people would literally be in close proximity with corpses or graves, usually of their own ancestors, and a series of traditional folk magical performances towards the dead in order to receive their messages and, and hidden knowledge were performed, to, to receive information either in the waking world or in dreams, perfected dreams from the simple act of sleeping over a burial mound to the theft of the skull of a dead ancestor. So, we understand the fear over necromancy if we take this into account. Uh, not only the fear of uh, disturbing the dead and therefore 
something terrible may befall the community of the living, which is in fact quite the animistic understanding, but mostly <laughs> within an Abrahamic religious mentality or religious beliefs or belief systems uh, and the need to preserve the body intact, whole. So it may be resurrected whole and as such the fear of necromancy increased as within the Abrahamic religious mentality the body could not be disturbed or even touched. Although, truth be told, the great majority of necromantic acts do not require physical contact with the dead, but instead creating a relationship with entities we deem to be the spirits of those who are dead or were once human. Still, the fear was augmented, especially during the Middle Ages as medicine advances and the desire to know the human body from within and, and how it works in order to treat several illnesses and injuries which, which would be far more ethical to discover how the human body functions by studying it on a corpse rather than on a living person. But again, the strong fear and religious desire of having to, to keep the body whole, intact for resurrection prevented medicine from advancing in many fields. All those who studied dead bodies in the name of science were thus accused of practicing necromancy and uh, convicted for the crime. The very fact that the term necromancy was often used as a synonym for witchcraft and therefore an act considered to be black magic dealing with demons as witchcraft was thought to be in the late Middle Ages, further distorted the meaning and the original intention of necromancy, increasing the fear of it. This association with demons during the late Middle Ages, this idea, came to change, perhaps forever, to this day at least, uh, what necromancy was truly about. It ceased to be a means of creating a symbiotic relationship with the spirits of the dead or the departed, to become a pact with demons in order to receive sorcerous powers and occultic magical knowledge. With the European Renaissance and the creation of several grimoires, spell books, magic books, with all sorts of magical sigils and symbology, necromancy actually became quite popular within the church itself, the, the Catholic Church, uh, as it was understood to be far more sophisticated as opposed to witchcraft. Uh, this has to do with two main ideas rooted within the European religious elite concerning witchcraft at the time. That witchcraft was thought to be a simple peasant superstition and for those who believed witchcraft to be the source of all evil and an alliance with the devil, witchcraft was then understood to be for the weak-minded, as demons had control over those who practiced witchcraft. Therefore, a witch did the bidding of a demon or of Satan himself, whereas necromancy was understood to be instead the control of demons through specific symbols and sigils and evocations, therefore thought to be far more sophisticated. And for those who consider themselves to have <laughs> greater control over their own minds and very intelligent people, as they could control demons to do their bidding and not the other way around. The late medieval and modern European beliefs that have created the separation between necromancy and witchcraft or in other words, a separation that lies in the belief that necromancy was sophisticated, powerful sorcery versus witchcraft as a peasant superstition or and a pact with the devil became very rooted in people's mentalities. And it did not help with works of fiction, gaming and TV series that further, further underline the belief that necromancy is the control of demons and the control of the dead to do the necromancers or the sorcerers bidding. So, in other words, necromancy, or at least what we originally have categorized as necromancy, uh, as a term for a 
specific magical art or act or performance, was creating and establishing communication with the dead or the departed or with those the living <laughs> understand to be the spirits of the dead or of the once human. There may be three types of people when it comes to dealing with death, even at the simple level of a conversation concerning death. Those who absolutely fear death and avoid it at all costs, which is perfectly understandable, and from such a fear of the unknown often comes, unfortunately, prejudice, hate, and even the impulsive behavior of demonstrating violence in order to avoid a fear solely based on ignorance. And then those who are curious enough to want to search for its, its mysteries and seek answers to their unquenchable and fervent desire to know more, uh, surely, perhaps precisely due to an underlying fear of death, and as such they seek out knowledge in order to appease their primal fears, thus avoiding more impulsive behaviors that can harm others and themselves. And finally, those who simply don't care, and perhaps those are the smartest and happiest. Be that as it may, those who are curious and seek to know will eventually find answers, which may not be entirely to their liking, but answers shall be found. And I think this is the first step into necromancy, the genuine curiosity. And in terms of this curiosity, I'm very much also including those who see or hear or, f or feel or sense or, or all the above entities we usually understand to be the manifestations of the departed. Either because some people were born this way, uh, with this ability, a question of oh, her hereditary question, or um, because a, a traumatic or a near-death experience changed their perceptions of what can be manifested in in the limited understanding of what constitutes reality, or because of the loud silence of their dreams, or simply because certain people are prone to be more sensitive to such manifestations, uh, for whichever reason. Curiosity is always there to understand what is going on, and why some things are happening, and how deep we can go. Curiosity is the first step and I'm sure to many of you, curiosity is the very thing that led you to watch this video and why you have reached this far. It doesn't seem to me that for most people the fear isn't of death itself, but rather what death may constitute in terms of strong emotions experienced by the living. Only the living fear death, sometimes as much as we fear living. We may fear death when we do not yet understand what it implies and what it means as a natural process of life. But as soon as we understand or, 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 or begin to understand that everything that lives will one day die and that death is uh, a necessity in the cycle of life, I think we cease to fear death itself because we begin to understand it as a process of transformation and uh, that the death of all things leads to a process of, or a kind of process of, of rebirth of sorts, and more existences are able to come forth and experience life. So it becomes more of a belief that not everything truly dies, but it is transformed instead. Everything changes. So since we are uh, all going to, to perish, <laughs> Uh, might as well enjoy life while it lasts before passing through an inevitable transformation because there's no telling what shall become of us or at least of our consciousness once our physical existence collapses. Change is as much needed in life as it is in death. Decay becomes a shift into other forms and other, other lives. We shall discuss this further ahead. Uh, but actually, uh, now that I remember, I've already mentioned uh, this on a previous video concerning death in animism and the change of both relationships, but the very change of the spirits who were once human. But through death, the spirits, or a spirit in general, is no longer human. 
and that changes the entire relationship we had with the person or persons that were once alive and we interacted with them. So death forces a change of behavior from the part of the living. If the living want to maintain relationships with the spirits we once knew as humans, living human beings. But let, let's not delve into that again. <laughs> so, as I was saying to many people, I don't think the fear is of death. Perhaps the fear of death itself is simply the fear of the unknown. And that sort of fear isn't exclusively towards death, but to everything else in life we are not yet familiar with. In that aspect, we fear a lot more of life than we do of death. Because unknown scenarios, spaces, actions, events and people is constantly present as different fears, obviously, as we progress through life. Perhaps the true fear is concerning the emotions provoked by death. Because we know death will come for us, eventually, no matter what. And so we eventually cease to fear it. What we mostly fear is the time that we have until death or how we are going to spend that time and the fear of losing those we love the most because they too will die. We fear the emotions provoked by death, the fear of loss and the fear on how death will be delivered to us, if there will be pain, if we are going to see ourselves in a terrible situation of pain and how long the pain has to last or how long we have to endure it until we finally die. Death has more impact upon the living rather than the dead. So again, it's not the fear of death as a natural process, I think, but the fear of feeling the inevitable cycles of life and all the emotions before our own death. So it really comes down to the question if we are going to deny ourselves our own life because of the fear of the unknown. Will we truly spend our entire life fearing the uncertain? Because only death is certain. But how death will be delivered to us and when, how long we have until then, the feelings of loss, how we are going to survive or deal with the feelings of loss and all of that is in fact uncertain. There's a time, place, space and mood for everything, so we will only truly know when the time comes and not before. So it's not death we fear perhaps, we fear the uncertainty of life. So how long will each one of us let that fear control our thoughts and our mind and even control our own life? Something to think about, perhaps. As previously said, there's this idea that necromancy is inherently demonolatry, which is a perception mostly constructed during the European Renaissance, as I've said before, uh, by the spread of books, of spells, or magical books, or grimoires, and the particular symbology of a heterogeneous nature. Basically, the evocation of entities understood to be demons and controlling them to do the sorcerer's bidding. However, necromancy is foremost speaking with the dead or, or the departed and uh, creating or trying to create a connection with the dead. But the idea of contacting demons isn't that old as associated from necromancy if we understand the oldest conception of a demon as a divinity or entity or spirit with whom or through which we can contact with or create contact which help us ultimately to create a connection with the entities of those we understand to be the spirits of the dead or of the once human. It works almost as a tutelary spirit within an animistic sense, right? Uh, an entity that serves as the means of connection between the living and the dead. Uh, an entity that will assist a person, a an assistant entity, uh, a helping spirit, a tutelary being, right? A familiar spirit. <laughs> the spirits of those with him to be, of those who were once human, do not exist in every turn of the corner, nor do they always want to be contact or even be assisted, nor should a person seek them out without the, the need for it or without a specific purpose and, and put themselves at a necessary risk. 
even when contact is necessary or asked for, it isn't always easy to create a relationship in order for specific spirits of the dead or, or in order to help them, the spirits of the dead, or being helped by them. So tutelary or helping entities, familiar spirits, indeed play their role in assisting with the, the building of relationships with specific spirits. A person may have the predisposition to hear or feel or sense or even see certain spirits or a particular traumatic event made the person more apt or open to have these experiences or simply having been born with this type of sensibility. However, it isn't always easy to create relationships with those who are physically and essentially quite different from us in their own existence that cannot be immediately interacted with the same way we interact with another human being or, or an animal. And sometimes it is even dangerous when we assume too much and do not measure the consequences of our impulses or even not having perceived the difficulties that are created due to the boundaries of existence or, or boundaries of existences and but also of the personalities and consciousness, right? Just like any living creature, just like every human and animal, spirits are all different and not all of the, the spirits we assume to be of the once human are equal either and none has the same intentions, motives and even the same consciousness. So assistant spirits in a way are, uh, let's say, necessary, uh, much like helping spirits in witchcraft and tutelary spirits in an animistic perception of a shamanic nature. These assistant spirits not only help in the building of relationship, but also in the recognition of entities with whom a relationship is trying to be established. And if it, if it, if it is even safe or even worth it to, to create these relationships or uh, these connections, so it is here that several connections are first built with entities that, one way or another, are connected to the reality of death and the spiritual. Could be a particular ancestor, could be a local entity, even a particular entity that was once a human being or an entity once an animal, could be an entity we of, often label as a, as a deity, as a, as a god or goddess like Anubis, uh, Hades, Hell, Hecate, Baruna, the Morrigan, Morana, etc. This to tell you that necromancy does have a series of rituals and performances that allows the person to first establish a connection with a tutelary spirit that by itself will help in conducting the necessary steps in order to progress and establish a relationship with others. So, after the first step of the acceptance of death previously spoken, the creation of a relationship with an entity that assists us in our evolution through the paths of communication with the dead constitutes an important achievement in the life of someone who seeks to understand why they experience the manifestation of others that are not immediately perceived through conventional means or by people who simply or naturally are not sensitive to experience the manifestations of these others. Uh, I'm not saying that establishing a relationship with a tutelary spirit is necessary, at least in the case of necromancy, but it is useful. Uh, sometimes uh, it isn't even a question of necessity or usefulness because <laughs> the first experiences we may have with spirits are precisely with those who are coming forth and trying to establish a relationship with us so they can be of assistance. However, I think it would do good to remember that not everybody experiences things the same way and the way some may experience the existence of spirits can be quite subtle and almost imperceptible if we do not pay enough attention. So, in this aspect, an assistant entity or a familiar spirit 
can help to augment the experience or even to amplify the manifestations from both sides. I'm not going to develop on the innumerable types of spirits that can be of assistance, nor will I tell you how to do it, how to perform it and what steps to take. I really do not believe that anyone has the ability or the power to help you in that aspect and teach you on how to do things, be that with an online course or a paid step-by-step -step workshop or, or even face-to-face uh, -face demonstrating practice and such. The only thing people can truly give is insight and advice and share experiences, tell the stories, make a little general introduction and um, provide some light into the nature of, of, our, of an art and uh, useful tips because what works for one person may not work for another and indeed when it comes to well uh, let's call it magic it's something very much personalized modified and adapted to suit a particular individual or a given task sometimes even an entire new and different behavior has to be conducted on the spot according to the momentary need so it's a question of trying and failing until succeeding and success depends very much on how you experience things and what better fits into your own consciousness and structure as a human being experiencing life and everything that is manifested in it. We may try, of course, an approach that works for somebody, uh, for someone else, but it may not work for us because it may not be the right approach that fits your own individuality. Therefore, it ends up being very frustrating and people end up giving up. So, immerse yourself in life and blend your existence with the very space that surrounds you. Curiosity is really the best element you have at your disposal. And I think everything else will be laid out before you and begin to take shape. Another point I would like to address is that sometimes you put yourself at real risk and in necromancy, just like in animism, in terms of creating relationships with spirits, it is to try to minimize as much damage and harm as possible. Some established relationships help to reduce or prevent harm. Other relationships are purely temporary according to a specific action or behavior or, or, or need that is uh, necessary in that moment. So basically we are talking about symbiotic relationships. But <laughs> there's also entities that do not want to create a relationship or want to seemingly create one in order to do harm or mischief or even cause death. Much like with relationships uh, with um, other human beings, Relationships with spirits or any other entities in the realms of what we perceive to be spiritual in opposition to the reality where we have a daily corporeal existence, uh, the intentions aren't always perceptible or even clear. The interaction with spirits can be caused by different things, be that hereditary or a traumatic event changed our perception, as I said before. Uh, an accident, a near-death experience, out-of-body experience, etc. That doesn't matter for now. What matters here is that from the moment our perception changes and we are more sensitive or predisposed to exper experience other entities, we are left in the open in the beginning and we are closer to real danger, grave danger, more than what can even cross our minds at first. Because the level of intensity that leads us to have contact with certain entities varies quite a lot from person to person. We are all built differently. May be stronger in one person and weaker on another. More often than not, it is a sentiment or a sense that gradually develops, but slowly. The more we interact, the more experience we gain. It can start by a single sound at first, or a visual distortion, feeling, hearing, sensing. It, it may slowly come in dreams or 
when we are wide awake. The point here is that there's a series of steps and the more curious we are, the more we want to know and delve into this and find out more. And in our eagerness, we often do something stupid or reckless or we start to think there's something truly special about us and only us. So we abandon irrational thoughts and our instincts as well and dive in head first and we take upon us or upon ourselves some sort of quest or right or even a personal crusade to aggrandize our sense of worthiness and exercise, exercise a, a self-illusion of authority and power. So we put ourselves at risk because at first we do not have the precious knowledge from experience and we force ourselves upon entities that aren't there with beneficial intentions, if you take my meaning. Uh, let's put it this way. It's like being in a forest and you find yourself alone, completely alone. Try to picture that. And in order to survive, you create symbiotic relationships with some animals and elements of nature. But not every creature in the forest will get used to your presence or even come to you or come close to you or, or, or showing a sense of trust. And not everything is edible either. So there are certain things and behaviors and actions you, you avoid. You are not going to eat every mushroom you find just because two weeks ago you have consumed a type of mushroom that was perfectly fine and now you feel perfectly fine. You may seek out some animals and learn from their behavior in order to, or, or so you, you can find food and shelter for yourself, but you will try to avoid going into certain territories where natural predators exist. Not everything out there is beneficial or friendly and not every predator will seek you out either. But just because they are not immediately seeking you out or hunting you, better not push your luck and seek them out for yourself and put yourself in close proximity with danger, real danger, like willingly <laughs> walking into a wolf's den. Um, let's create another mind image, shall we? Uh, to perhaps better illustrate this. You are inserted into a landscape and you have a, a, a danger meter. In that danger meter, you have a pointer or a, an indicator that constantly oscillates between the green and the red. And right in the middle, there is the yellow. The green is the safe zone. <laughs> the red is the danger zone. While you walk in a particular area, the pointer is in the green space. But as you move closer to danger, the pointer sways closer to the yellow. And at this point, you move around to see which course to take that will sway back to the green. You take a step in this direction and it sways to the yellow. You take a step into the other direction and it sways into the green. So you start to measure the environment or this space and you gain knowledge about it and you begin to know the boundaries. The more you move into a dangerous area, the closer the pointer gets to the red. So if it isn't extremely necessary, there's no need to put yourself in danger so willingly without measuring the space or the environment, without first having experienced how far you can get with the knowledge you have at this point. So when you start having the first experiences, they might not be strong yet. So there's no need to put yourself at risk unnecessary. Meaning you don't have the danger meter yet. So tread lightly. Don't go into, the, into, the, into a cave yet if you still don't know if it is occupied and who or what occupies it. Could be empty, surely, or could harbor a starving bear. Just because a bear isn't after you, there's no point in seeking out the bear without necessity. Learn from what you have and what can be experienced at this point. Curiosity can lead to a blind eagerness to explore more than you have capacities and knowledge and skill for. At first, you don't yet know which entities are 
safe or dangerous and you don't yet know the intentions, the motives. And while you may gain knowledge and experience as you go, you won't be fully protected and safe from danger because it is always unpredictable. And each entity has a personality or individuality and intention of, of its own. So you never truly know the extent of danger or safety. Surely, no one will prevent you from behaving in a certain way or going out by your own, uh, uh, by your own accord and, and seek out a specific entity or doing a specific practice of, of performance or even ritual in this place or that place. You are free from doing that, but at your own risk. But if it isn't really necessary, why putting yourself at risk? Uh, I'm specifically saying this because of the romanticized ideas that humans upon death remain the same as some sort of shade or ghost or spectrum uh, that in form or at least in appearance resembles their previous human form and that they can even remember who they have been before. We are here talking about necromancy, right? So it is in great part the communication with the dead, with those who were once human or, or the departed. But not every entity we deem to be a spirit of someone who was once alive and human is in fact what we believe it is. The important thing to take in mind is that even the human person can change upon death, upon death of the body, of the physical body, and after death becoming something else entirely. The transformation of the dead, uh, as I've pointed out on the previous, uh, previously mentioned the video concerning death in animism. Uh, no point uh, into getting to, into, in getting into that all over again. But I think it is important to remember that not every spirit that seems to be the spirit of a dead human is in fact a dead human. As the nature of many entities isn't what we often assume to be as, 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 uh, as, as a spirit of, of uh, a dead person, a completely harmless or a harmless ghost, but simply their own nature and form of existence may not be one immediately perceived by human senses, but that doesn't mean they are dead or that they are incapable of thoughts and actions of their own. And this also goes very much to the entities of those we deem to be the spirits of the human dead or, or those who were once human, because upon death an entity and its consciousness changes. The longer they experience and live in a certain condition, the likely it will be that they will forget they were once human or animal or, or even having been once local entities of this and that or whatever. Death isn't solely the transformation of the physical, of the corporeal existence, but also the transformation of mentalities, consciousness, and the transformation of relationships, ultimately. The intentions also change, the behavior changes, and actions from both sides are hard to measure, which can cause real harm and damage and even death. So, at first, it may begin as a sound or even a glimpse of a form crossing your sight, and you become aware that there's something else in there or out there, and you are not entirely al alone. And at the same time, whatever, whatever it is, becomes aware of you as well. This doesn't mean that there isn't the chance that you may be in danger and to suffer harm. We are all actually quite vulnerable to a lot of things that can harm us. But it, it's just a question of trying to minimize damage and harm as much as possible. If you tread lightly, you may still suffer f some harm and damage, but not as much as if you directly put yourself in danger, right? Again, just because you walk in a part of the forest, far from a bear's cave, doesn't mean you are not going to be attacked by a bear. It just means that there are fewer chances from that to happen. The percentage of being attacked by a bear is lower. However, the closer you get to the bear's cave, the percentage of being attacked by a bear increases. 
you are walking towards danger willingly so be cautious sometimes danger is not immediately perceived even with a tutelary person or assistant or a familiar spirit but we try to mitigate the, the, the chances of being harmed and for that we do not walk into danger so willingly and unprepared. The best choice is always to let them come to you. In this case of necromancy we are dealing with today, let the entities we assume to be the spirits of the dead come to us and not the other way around because we do not truly know the intentions at first and who is willing to establish a relationship and contact and for which purpose. Let, the, let them come into your own grounds. This doesn't mean that some won't approach to cause harm and mischief. Of course, that can happen. But there are fewer chances of that to happen. You do not seek out a spirit to help it when help wasn't required, or asked for, or even demanded. It will seek you out if it wants help or if it wants anything really. Better to let them come to you and express themselves to you rather, rather than blindly assume that you have some right or, or being on a quest to help everything and everyone there is and just set out into the gloom uh, seeking to help even those that have not asked for your presence let alone your help or any interaction you want to forcibly create just because you got it in your head. When they need and when they recognize your perception and sensibility and your openness to this, they shall come to you and let themselves be known. You are never free from risk and danger, but you can minimize danger with actions you choose to take and if you trust time and the experience that comes with it and ultimately the knowledge you can shield yourself with. Always be wary. So this video is getting too long and uh, this is where we depart. I think this is far enough for today when it comes to taking the first step into necromancy. Of course, uh, it isn't any, an easy process when the first vestiges or a certain sensibility or sensitivity to this starts to be revealed to the person. Anyone saying that it is a beautiful experience and quite peaceful and the dead just want help and cross over and nothing to be afraid of, well, that person is probably trying to sell something. It isn't a question of finding beauty in it or even a purpose for that matter, but it happens. And it is an intensive struggle to comprehend or try to comprehend what is going on. And it's certainly something scary. And that sentiment may never change or go away, which is perfectly natural, perfectly normal. It also depends on the experiences people have and what triggers this. I've often heard people saying to me that, the, that what triggered this was an out-of-body experience provoked by a near-death experience, which, which happens, of course, obviously. And, uh, but also, they also say that it was wonderful and peaceful and beautiful. And that last part, I find, I find that hard to believe. Uh, I won't deny that it is certainly curious and in a way uh, there's this wish to experience it again as it is something unfamiliar and beyond the mundane recognizable reality but it is a tremendous shock, often agonizing as it is unfamiliar and it's quite the extreme toll on the physical body sometimes leading to excruciating pain and the terrible sense of dread and that feeling of imminent danger as if we are about to drown and desperately fighting for air even before being in actual danger but it's just that pre-recognition that something quite terrible is about to happen again and there's no time to be mentally prepared for it when you are still trembling from the previous experience and, and on the verge of losing your mind as you are already feeling that something is about to make a strong knot and pull it until it bursts within your head. This is, after all, an abrupt change of perception. And it's not just turning things upside down, but it's also, at the same time, walking into an 
unfamiliar and unknown environment without any previous knowledge or mentorship. So, it is indeed scary and agonizing at times. But time, experience, circumstances and knowledge will pave the way. But I don't believe it ever becomes peaceful and beautiful and normalized because each case is a case. Each entity has its own consciousness and intentions and we are never truly free from experiencing harm and damage and ultimately death. This is just a perception obviously. We all experience things differently with different intensities and different levels of sensibility. What works for one person doesn't always work for another. So I would like very much uh, to hear your thoughts in this and if you would be so kind share your experiences with all of us. Thank you so much for watching, see you on the next video and as always thank you for today. I bid you all a very fond farewell. Goodbye my dear friends.